have been quite a few striking differences between how Europeans and Americans view the power of big technology companies. And it's understandable if you look at the presence of many of the big tech companies in Silicon Valley in the United States. It, it really brings them closer to home and could create the impression that the American interests and the interests of these companies are overlapping. And so I would say America has had a much more hands-off approach to regulating tech companies. In Europe, on the other hand, there's been more of an emphasis on uh, how to actually make sure that regulations extend into the digital world. Oftentimes, the picture is painted that Europe is a super regulator, that uh, the EU is super ambitious in regulating technology, and that the US is not doing anything at all. And I think reality is not as black and white. If you look at the United States today, there's 47 attorneys general that are investigating Google for possible violation of antitrust rules. There are cities like San Francisco that have banned facial recognition technologies. There is a California Privacy Act that's mirrored after the general data protection regulation in the European Union. I see very progressive discussions in the United States about the challenges of facial recognition systems mostly for minorities and how they might be biased as systems. Whereas in Europe, there would be broader questions about the compatibility between facial recognition systems and the right to privacy, for example. I think the EU has a lot of work to do to actually make sure that regulation spans a full scope of issues where the public interest is at stake. Think about anti-discrimination, think about uh, fair competition and really how to transform antitrust rules for the digital age. Also questions about transparency and accountability for artificial intelligence. And now that last point, the impact of artificial intelligence, I think is front and center in a lot of political discussions in the United States as well. The Trump administration understood very well that there can be benefits, but also harms from the spread of AI and other sensitive technologies. Well, I've often heard people saying, my 14 year old kid doesn't care about privacy or my neighbor posts all of these scandalous pictures herself. So none of them can complain later. And I think it's a somewhat simplified view of the complexity of the ecosystem of information flows, privacy questions, possible risks that people take when they just click one button to go join a platform or share information. When people use medication, they are not made responsible to understand everything that goes into the pill that they swallow. In fact, there's all kinds of standards and regulations to make sure that those medications don't even hit the pharmacies before being checked and checked again and independently verified and tested on people, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we somehow expect from individuals to have all the information about how tech companies are going to process data, what they may do later to change the terms of service. And I think that that's, it's a power imbalance in the decision making and the information that the company has versus the customer that is just completely off. I think it's important to empower individuals, not so much by educating them, which I often hear, and surely that's important, but mostly by making sure that the tech companies meet certain standardized requirements that make it better and easier to provide oversight, uh, to test and verify independently and test again, similar to what we would do with medications or cars for that matter. To understand why the tech sector has not been regulated like other sectors, for example, pharmaceutical or automotive sector or the food and drug industry, we have to go back to Silicon Valley, which knows a very libertarian culture from which the tech sector really sprung up. And I'm pretty sure that some of the initial tech pioneers could not have imagined that their innovative products would turn into such powerful, globally spanning, multi-billion dollar earning companies. But as those startups became very, very powerful and successful, the regulatory oversight or independent checks and balances have not stayed in sync with that growth and that increase of power. And perhaps it was because people hoped that with the spread of these technologies, liberty and democracy would spread alongside we now know that that did not happen, whether it was a realistic promise or not. We now know that power without counterpower is dangerous, and so it is important to step up the checks and balances. It's also an essential promise 
in the US political system. And we could imagine a bigger convergence between what Americans and Europeans are doing to on the one hand say, look, we understand that digitization is here and we see the potential for benefits for all of society, but that doesn't come automatically. The market doesn't always provide for all the necessary preconditions. Governments have to step in in order to have fairness, safety, very important, uh, public health, but also questions of redistribution and the socioeconomic impact of what is called the platform economy. Now, another dimension where we have big differences is how we think about how economic principles should apply to the digital realm. In the European Union, most European countries, uh, there is broad support for having more tax rules and taxation of tech companies, even though the T word seems to be a taboo in the United States from time to time. But Europeans need not only to convince Americans that taxing tech companies is necessary and urgent, they also need to do their own homework. There are a couple of EU member states, notably Ireland, Luxembourg, but also the Netherlands, where I'm from, that have very favorable tax rules that tech companies have used to the maximum uh, of the extent possible. So it could be a combination of innovation incentives and low corporate tax rates that essentially lead to the end sum of not paying much tax at all. And I would say that the legitimacy of not paying any taxes and using all the little loopholes with the help of armies of lawyers is really eroding. And you don't have to distinguish between Americans and Europeans when it comes to that criticism simply because the price for society versus the profits for companies is diverging to such an extent that it's no longer acceptable. And I would say that change is coming in that space, but both in Europe and the United States, a lot of homework needs to be done to correct what is essentially an unfair system. Some might wonder, why does it even matter that Americans and Europeans work together on shared standards? And I think the answer is in the fact that they Europeans and Americans together were really starting to build a rules-based international order together. They've been taking responsibility for a world order where institutions ensure that there is fairness, that human rights matter, and that economic rules are also in place. And strangely enough, there's been a bit of a break with that tradition. There has not been such an effort to extend a rules-based international order to the digital world and the digital economy. And at the same time, there are other countries, other global players, most significantly China, that do offer a completely different model of governing technologies compared to those of, of democracies, for example. They may refer to it as a sovereignty model. It's a more top-down, state-led, control-enhancing model. And clearly, the transatlantic relation has not been very easy. There's been a lot of confrontation, fragmentation over the past four years. And uh, I'm afraid it plays into the hands of more authoritarian regimes, of those who seek to undermine a liberal rules-based order. So the urgency should not only come from whether there's a great sense of friendship in the political relation, but rather from the sense of urgency that I think the rest of the world really creates. Because otherwise, the rules and the standards and the principles of the digital economy and the digital world, including cybersecurity and technical standards, will probably be set by others. So this is really a matter of defending self-interest by working together. So one big question is, can democratic institutions keep up with technological disruption and essentially are they strong enough to even offer counterweight in providing for the protection of, of people's safety and fundamental rights in society. And I would say the institutions are theoretically strong enough, but much will depend on the political will and the efforts to demand ways to understand what is essentially going on under the technological hood to have a better informed public debate evidence-based public policies and ways to really address the challenges and not just the symptoms that may be more visible. So the challenge is significant for lawmakers. Some people were kind of uh, laughing at the hearings that they saw in Congress, but also in the European Parliament. And while on the one hand I can understand that there's 
also scrutiny on the lawmakers as they're trying to put the fire to someone like Mark Zuckerberg. I think the question is really what is essentially most important? Is it a hearing or is it a legislative process? And if it is hard for lawmakers to understand the technologies, why is that? And I would say when it comes to business models of social media companies like Facebook, but also search engines and other products like Google or Amazon with its online marketplace, how much can somebody in Parliament realistically get to know and understand about how the technology works? Because a lot of it is proactively shielded from public scrutiny and from transparency. My hope is that there can be a bridging of the knowledge gap both on the part of politicians vis-a-vis -vis technology, but also on the part of technologists and engineers when it comes to understanding the rule of law and democracy. And an aspect that doesn't help there, uh, you could think about it as a knowledge exchange, but it's really a revolving door, is when representatives from big tech companies get hired by governments and vice versa to really increase lobbying efforts, uh, government affairs in the most cynical ways. So for example, when in the United States new antitrust investigations were announced, immediately uh, big tech companies like Google started hiring people out of the offices on Capitol Hill that used to be or that were responsible for antitrust uh, legislations. So ideally, democratic governments will really start working together to preserve the very foundations that have been essential ingredients for the quality of life of people. So to preserve fundamental rights, but also fairness in the economy, and to look at how those principles are at stake in new ways through new technologies. In the worst case scenario, there will be a much more of a standoff and we will see more nationalistic and protectionist reactions to the impact that technology has. And even though in the short term that may sound attractive, in the long run I think it will be uh, very difficult to overcome the differences in standards but also the differences in approaches when we stand with our backs towards each other.